Well, greetings once again, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us here at Fresh Vision Church. I want you to know that regardless of where you're fi you find yourself at, I have been praying for you. So if there's anything that we can pray for you about or any way we can minister to you, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And you can do that by going to our website at fvcelp.org, or you can go to one of our social media pages. And if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, you can leave a comment on one of the spaces below, or if you can, you can give us a thumbs up or uh, share it, uh, like it, you know, just let us know that you were definitely blessed by this message. So this morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 16 and I've titled today's message, Whom Do You Serve? Now in this new chapter that we're about to begin, Jesus will challenge his disciples and the Pharisees about temporal values and worldly ways of thinking. Now for the most part, most of the material in this chapter is unique to Luke. And it deals with wealth and money management. Among other things, you'll see how easy it is for wealth and social prominence to sidetrack a person from life's real values. So I hope that this morning's message will show you that life is a stewardship and you must use your God-given opportunities faithfully. I also hope that it challenge you, challenges you to answer this question, whom do you serve? Well, before I get into God's Word, let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you provided the means for this message out there um, in the World Wide Web, whether it be on YouTube, Facebook, or any other platform, um, we're thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. I pray that you will bless this message that we're about to read and the message that is about to be delivered. Um, I pray that it reaches the hearts and minds of all those that um, it's meant for, Lord, and that you will um, radically change them, change their hearts soften their hearts so they can draw near and closer to you, Lord. So remove all distractions right now, Lord. Help us to focus so that we may give you all of our attention. So we dedicate this time to you and give you all the glory. Thank you again for blessing us and speak to us now. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, as I mentioned, we're going to be in Luke chapter 16, and we're going to be beginning in verse 1. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. Now he, Jesus, said to the disciples, There was a rich man who received an, accu an accusation that his manager was squandering his possessions. So he called the manager in and asked, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you can no longer be my manager. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I'm removed from management, people will welcome me into their homes. So he summoned each one of his master's debtors. How much do you owe my master? He asked the first one. A hundred measures of oil, he said. Well, take your invoice, he told him. Sit down quickly and write fifty. Next, he asked another, how much do you owe? A hundred measures of wheat, he said. Take your invoice, he told him, and write eighty. The man is the righteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd than the children of the light in dealing with their own people. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of worldly wealth, so that when it fails, they may welcome you into eternal dwellings. Whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And whoever is unrighteous in very little is also unrighteous in much. So if you have not been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with what is genuine? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God 
and money. Well, the Lord Jesus now turns from the Pharisees and scribes to the disciples with a lesson on temporal positions, possessions, and power. In this parable, Jesus pictured a discredited manager who was about to be fired by his employer for squandering his possessions. Before that can happen, though, the manager evaluated his situation and realized that he had nothing else to fall back on. See, he knew he was too old and not strong enough to go back to the manual, to manual labor. And he was too proud to beg for hand, handouts from friends and strangers. So using the skills that he developed as a manager, he came up with a plan that would win friends who would later show kindness to him in a time of need. The plan was simple. He would discount the accounts of his master's debtors. To one who owed a hundred measures of oil, he slashed it to 50. To another who owed a hundred measures of wheat, he cut it to 80. The shocking part of this story occurs when the master praised the unrighteous manager for acting shrewdly. Was this an approval of his conduct? Well, no, not really. The master was essentially saying, I like what you did, just not how you did it. See, he wasn't commending him for his crookedness but for rather having a business plan that showed foresight. First, it made the landowner, the, the rich man, look good in the eyes of those who were indebted to him and who continued to do business with him. Second, it looked forward to the long term rather than on the present moment. And third, it assured people would be indebted to the manager and thus honor bound to help him when he'd need it. Now, if you want to apply this into your own life, it's important that you understand that your, fu that your future as a child of God isn't on this earth, but in heaven. Just as the manager took steps to ensure that he would have friends during his retirement here below, you as a Christian should use God's gifts and blessings in such a way that would ensure a welcoming party when you get to heaven. Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous person will be enriched, and the one who gives a drink of water will receive water. Well, Jesus then put the parable in context by adding in verse 8, the children of this age are more shrewd than the children of the light in dealing with their own people. In other words, in this world, the children of the light, that is, believers who have God's light in them and shining through them, are often more foolish in their dealings with other people than are the secular people who have no concern for God. We as Christians, therefore, should be just as dedicated to living out our faith and values among non-Christians, among the non-believers of the world, as they are in living out their own values to their advantage in this world. See, if we pursued the kingdom of God with the same vigor and zeal that the children of the world pursue profits and pleasure, I believe that we would live in a completely different world. Imagine a world where more Christians were as determined as this manager here to do something about a bad situation instead of throwing their arms up in the air and just giving up. Imagine a world where Christians use their God-given skills and abilities to accomplish what God intended the gospel to do. And imagine a world where more Christians were just as willing to make the same personal sacrifices 
that many of today's entrepreneurs had to make or are making to achieve their success. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, when a man truly becomes what he is meant to be under God, he then begins to realize what faculties and propensities he has, and he begins to use them. And so you will find that the greatest periods and epochs in history of countries have always been those eras that have followed in the wake of great religious reformation and revivals. Well, back to our passage. Jesus drives the point home in verse 9. Make friends for yourself by means of worldly wealth, so that when it fails, they may welcome you into eternal dwellings. In other words, we should use money and other material things in such a way as to win souls for Christ and thus form friendships that will endure throughout eternity. Money and many of the things it buys may be unrighteous in, this, in themselves, but they can be used for good. But in order for that to happen, you must recognize that those things are only temporary and one day they'll be of no use to you. So while you're here, while you're alive, while you're breathing, while you still can, use them. But don't make them the end, only the means. Used in this way, the money you have and the things you own can help you to prepare for eternity. How, you may ask? By sharing them with the poor, blind, the lame, and the crippled. By doing that, you're not only blessing others, but you're also storing up treasures in heaven. And just as the grateful debtors would, would welcome the manager into their homes, so you would be welcomed to your eternal home when you leave this world and everything that you once owned. Meeting you there will be Jesus and all those people who were saved through your sacrificial giving and prayers. These people will thank you, saying, it was you who invited me here. Now let us show you to your new heavenly treasures. Well, upon hearing this parable, it's possible that the disciples may have blown it off. They may have dismissed it as not applicable to them since they had already given up everything to follow him. Jesus, however, told them in verses 10 and 11 that no matter how few resources they have, to be trustworthy with them. He wanted them to understand that the more a person gets into the habit of being generous with the resources they've been entrusted with, the more they'll be trusted with. So you see, if God sees that you're faithful in managing what is least, He'll also see you'll be faithful in managing much, no matter what the value is, no matter how high the value is. Now, you must look out for the other side of this truth. Why? Because it, be, it can be quite easy to convince yourself that it doesn't really make much of a difference how you handle the little you have. This can then lead you to start justifying the reasons for cheating or for misleading others and even squandering those resources. Oh, you may say, it's just unrighteous money. In the end, it's not worth anything. So I might as well spend it all, use it all on myself. Again, Jesus emphasized the habit you form now stays with you. Be faithful in little and you will be faithful in much. But if you're unfaithful in little, you'll be unfaithful and unreliable if you're given the opportunity to manage many resources. Furthermore, if you are unfaithful in, and unreliable in worldly goods, it'll be difficult for anyone to trust you with heavenly goods. 
in verse 12. Verse 12 distinguishes what is another's and what is your own. Now one way of looking at this verse is this. If you cannot prove trustworthy and faithful at managing someone else's treasure, you won't value your own treasure. For example, let's say you asked me to take care of a one carat diamond that you owned and that was valuable to you and sentimental. But I wasn't aware of its meaning and value. And then I carelessly lost it. I tossed it aside in the back of my closet or um, my rock collection or I don't know, I gave it to, the, to, to my little puppies to eat or to play around with. Do you think that I'd be responsible to take care of a two carat diamond if it were actually given to me? Probably not. Thus, in order to appreciate the value in what you've been given, you must learn to value it when it belongs to somebody else. Otherwise, you'll take what you have for granted and squander it. Now, here's another way to look at this verse. All that you have, your money, your time, your talents, belong to the Lord. And you're to manage them. That which is our own refers to the rewards that we'll reap in this life and in the life to come as a result of our faithful service to Christ. So, if we have not been faithful in what is His, how can He give us what is our own? Then, in typical fashion, Jesus summarizes the overall point of this parable in verse 13. Since it's utterly impossible to live for things and for God at the same time, He tells His disciples that they must make a choice who they're going to serve. But no servant can serve two masters. Anyone who thinks they can is only fooling themselves that they're going to be loyal to bo both. When the truth is, either he will hate one or, and love, love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Therefore, a choice will have to be made between being faithful to a temporal master or to an eternal master, slaves of wealth or slaves of the Creator. Now, just to be clear, I, I, I do, I want to clarify this point. One can have both money and God, but one cannot serve both God and money. Now, how can you tell who or what you serve? One way is by this principle. You will sacrifice to your God. If you will sacrifice for the sake of money, but will not sacrifice for the sake of Jesus, don't deceive yourself. Be honest with yourself. Money is your God. On Friday afternoon, 1990, a businessman staggered to the steps of his Los Angeles office. Before he died of the gunshot wound to his chest, he called out the names of his three children, but he still had his $10,000 Rolex watch clutched to his hand. He was the victim of a rash of Rolex robberies and was killed as a sacrifice to his God. If you're mastered by money, you cannot really be serving the Lord. See, in order to accumulate wealth, you're going to have to devote all your time, all your energy, and all your effort into it. But by doing that, you're actually robbing God of, of what is rightfully His. But not only that, your loyalty will be divided. Your motives will be mixed. And your decisions will be based on what financially benefits you. When you're devoted to serving money, It'll cry out for all that you have and all that you are. Your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. The very same things that Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, verse 20, that we should be giving to the Lord. Now, 
There are some who think that just because they're not rich, they're not a slave to money. But you don't have to be rich to serve money. Those who are poor and barely making ends meet have just as much potential for greed and covetousness as the rich have. I've read and heard so many stories about the horrible things, people who had nothing, who came from nothing, what they had to do to themselves or to others in order to get rich. And I'm sure that many of you have as well. Solomon, one of the wisest men who ever lived, said in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, the one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver, and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. However, if God is your master, then money will be your servant. And you'll see it and want to use it as a means to accomplish the will of God. Now, friends, don't be mistaken. Money isn't evil. The Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. Actually, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So, make money your servant and use the opportunities and resources you've been given today as investments in kingdom treasures that 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 describes as an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So be a wise steward. There are so many souls out there to win for the Savior, to win for Jesus Christ. And your money can help get the job done. Well, so far, Jesus had been primarily speaking to his disciples. But lo and behold, there was another group eavesdropping. So if you still have your Bibles open, let's go to verse 14 and read about how that went. Luke chapter 16, verse 14. The Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and scoffing at him. And he told them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly admired by people is revolting in God's sight. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God has been proclaimed, and everyone is urgently invited to enter it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to drop out. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. And everyone who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. As you just saw, this parable didn't go over so well with the greedy Pharisees as they were listening to it. So they began to treat Jesus disrespectfully. It says that they scoffed at him, but really they did. They, they started to disrespect him by rid ridiculing him and what he had just said. See, being in the upper financial and social echelons of society, they saw money as a tool of gaining influence and popularity. So in their minds, they thought they were serving both God and money. But, as Luke says, they were lovers of money. Their service was not geared to glorify God and to help their neighbors, but rather to enrich themselves. Jesus then told them in verse 15 that what they valued is not what God valued. Outwardly, the Pharisees appeared to be pious and in spiritual order to win public approval and to make others think that they were God's favorite people. But inwardly, beneath their religious facade, God saw the greed in their hearts. Now others may have admired them for appearing holy and righteous and they may have looked up to them to 
as examples of the kind of people that they want to be. But they couldn't deceive God. And it was revolting in His sight. I once heard someone say, for some people the idea that God knows our hearts is comforting. For others, it's a curse. Now, the lesson here is that self-justification doesn't work with God. Just because a person, or maybe even you, come across as righteous, religious, and wise, and are admired for appearing that way, it doesn't mean that God admires you too. No. He judges us by a different set of values. Values that come from a heart that sees to please Him and not man. See, many of the things that people admire about a person are the very same things that God detests. Think of the men and women in our world today who have power, wealth, and beauty. Millions admire them. They have tons of followers on social media. They have fans all over the world. They have men, women, and children who want to be just like them. They're influential. But here's the thing, if their hearts are serving something else, God doesn't care. It's like, whatever. Why? Because as it says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, humans do not see what the Lord sees. For humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. God cares more about people who are living to glorify Him than themselves. So take your choice. Who will be your master? The people or God? In whose eyes do you want justification? People's or God's? If God, then live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Jesus then continues to correct their wrong way of thinking in verse 16 by informing them that the law was not what they thought it was. The Pharisees claimed to honor the law and the prophets. They prided themselves on the careful observance of it. They were the experts, the go-to guys. But that same pride blinded them from recognizing that the that the coming of John the Baptist was the end of the Old Covenant and that a new one had begun the moment he introduced Jesus to the world. Since then, the good news of the Kingdom of God has been proclaimed and everyone is urgently invited to enter it. It wasn't enough anymore to be just an expert in interpreting, explaining, and in obeying God's Word found in the Old Testament. Now, one must answer the call, pick up their cross, and enter God's kingdom through the narrow door. Thus, if the Pharisees wanted to keep up to date with God, then they need to be listening to the new Word that was being taught and revealed in the life of Jesus. Unfortunately, though, they were so intent not to step outside of the religious box that not only were they failing to enter the kingdom, but they also failed to recognize the truth. The truth was standing right in front of them. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus discarded the written word of the law and the prophets. The Old Testament remain valid in his day and still remains valid today. In fact, he says it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for any portion of the Old Testament to drop out. By this, Jesus was making it clear that all of it, all of the New Testament was still the Word of God. 
and is as powerful now as it was when he uttered it and men transcribed it. It's important, however, that we keep in mind that all the words found in the Old Testament must be held in light of the new revelation in Jesus. Our Lord showed us the spirit, meaning, and purpose of the law in a new and radically different manner than the Pharisees viewed the law. It was as if Jesus flipped on the light switch and all of a sudden the purpose and meaning of God's law was as clear as day. But the religious leaders didn't like it. They were uncomfortable with it. They were happy with the status quo. Why? It was more beneficial to them to use the law as a source of threat and judgment so that they can hold it over people's heads. But through his life and teachings, Jesus Christ revealed that the law was actually an opportunity for us to express our love to God through obedience. And furthermore, it also gives us an opportunity to express our love to others through the central message of the law's call, which was to love our neighbor, help the poor, and to care for orphans and wid widows, which was Jesus' definition of religion. Had it not been for Christ, bringing us the full meaning and understanding and obedience to God's word, we'd still have religious leaders controlling our lives with fear and wrath. But thank God that there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And that's found in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now, verse 18, if you look at it carefully, if you see it just on its own, it almost looks like it's out of place, like someone just stuck it in there because it has nothing to do with what he had just, what he was just talking about. But it actually does. See here, Jesus uses the example of divorce to show them, to show the Pharisees that their ongoing validity of God's law was deficient. Everyone listening would have understood the point. See, they had watered this law down so much that divorce was allowed for the most trivial of reasons. So by misusing Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 and 4, they had voided what the law said about marriage and then justified it by referring back to their traditions. Thus the sacredness of marriage, which was established at creation, was treated with mockery. So whenever they wanted to come down on someone for picking wheat on the Sabbath, then they would treat the law reverently. It would make a big deal about it. However, if it were for their own personal benefit, they would manipulate the law, they would cut corners, they would find loopholes and made a fool of it. So the Pharisees, having mocked Jesus because of his teaching on riches, have suddenly had the tables turned on them. They're seen as totally unreliable guides and as destroying what lies at the very root of a stable society, the family. Rather than simply argue with them about riches, he has totally laid bare the bankruptcy of their whole lives and teaching. Again, Jesus emphasized the point, under the new covenant, God still cares about his law and he still cares about your obedience. As, as I begin to close, let me try to summarize what I just shared with you here. If we want to be kingdom people, then we must begin kingdom living while we're in this world. 
members of the kingdom must live with the same resources and challenges as the secular person. Too often the secular person outsmarts kingdom people in their use of the world's resources to get ahead, to plan ahead, and to influence other people. But kingdom people also need to use the world's resources with acumen and wisdom. Kingdom people have to have a clear vision of the future. They ought to be pointing towards eternity, not just towards tomorrow. Thus, kingdom living means using the world's resources to help those kingdom people Jesus consistently pointed to. The poor, the lame, the blind, the crippled. Using world resources generously to help Jesus' people is wise planning for the future. It leads to meeting those people who are waiting to greet us in heaven. Kingdom people are single-minded people. They don't hold to both the world and the kingdom. They know no one can be a slave who obeys two masters. Nor do they need to justify their kingdom existence before other people. God justifies. People do not. What people see as justification, God sees as detestable, as reprehensible. Kingdom people live out new resources the world does not have. Even the world of the religious and pious. Kingdom people have entered Jesus' kingdom. Something new beyond the authority and life of Moses and the prophets. They do not destroy the old authority. They fill it full. So, let me ask you. Are you a kingdom person who is kingdom living? If not, I'd like to invite you to become one by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If that's what you'd like to do, if your answer is yes, I am ready to open up the door to my heart to Jesus. I'm ready to surrender my life to Him. Then you have to understand this. Jesus wants your undivided loyalty. He wants it all. He doesn't want part of it. He doesn't want 90% of it. He wants 100% of your heart. But that's a choice that you have to make. He'll never force you. He wants you to come to Him freely and willingly. That way, when people ask you, whom do you serve? Without hesitation, you'll say, I serve Jesus. No one else but Jesus. So if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to commit yourself completely to Him, then I want to lead you in a prayer to do that. So wherever you're at, close your eyes, bow your head, and pray this with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I'll turn for my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Welcome to the kingdom of God. If you heard last week's message, you know that there's a celebration in heaven right now. There's a big party going on up there. There's joy among the angels because a new person has been born again. So if you prayed that, let us know. Reach out to us, call us, text us, message us, email us, 
There's several ways to do that. Again, you can go to our website and do that. You can go on our social media pages. Um, it, the information's out there, so definitely. You can even write us a letter through the snail mail. It's been a while since I received one of those, but let us know. Um, it's always good to hear stories of, of that, that this ministry, what we're doing here is actually changing lives. But also, we want to help lead you into your next steps of your Christian walk. If you're far away, we want to maybe help you find a church where you can go, a good Bible teaching church where you can go. Um, if you're here locally, we want to invite you to come check us out. Now that we've opened our doors, you, know, it's, you can come by and check us out. We'll, we'll give you a mask and maybe some hand sanitizer, and, and, but still, we'd like to, to see you here. And I know that you'll also grow in your relationship and your knowledge of the Lord. And, and I think that you will get along with everyone here. Um, so, again, I, I can't stress it enough. Let, let us know. Contact us. I want to hear from you. Well, that concludes this, this week's message. Again, I hope that there was something here that spoke to you. I hope that you were challenged. I hope that you were convicted. I hope that this has actually led you to go even further, even deeper into this passage and maybe find more truths. But I also hope that you were blessed by it. I hope you all have a great week. I'll be praying that all of you stay healthy so that as you begin to step out of your home, you'll be the salt and light of your communities or that you'll use your resources to lead people to Christ. Be wise and you will be blessed. Have a great week and I'll see you next week.